And welcome everybody to a CCNA live stream for Cisco 20301 CCNA certification. It is great to have you. And I've, it's scientifically been proven that it's easier to hear somebody if their microphone is on. So thank you all for all that feedback a moment ago. Our objective today in this live stream is simple. We want to take a look at OSPF neighbor states and what they are and also how to remember them. So by the time we're done with this session, you and I will be able to go ahead and just simply remember a mnemonic that'll help us remember and we can actually describe each of the neighbor states. And then also when we see them in production, we'll actually know what they are and, and why they got there. I'd also like to thank Darshan for the recommendation. He had in a chat a message on the on the on the channel that said, I'm studying or I'd like to get more information on the neighbor states. Can you go over that? And the answer is absolutely yes. So it's thanks to uh, you for that recommendation that we're having this live stream right now to be recorded for other people. So OSPF is a fantastic, oh, you want to, let me give you an insight too. Um, a moment ago when I didn't have my mic on <laughs> and I restarted the stream, uh, I was saying that I'm paying my wife $5 for every time I say, uh, and I also mentioned that when I create content for CBT Nuggets, it's planned out, structured, very tight, and there's no uhs in there. And when I do my live streams, somehow the uh creeped in. And so... That uh didn't count because that's describing what the uh is. And so I'm going to make a conscious effort in this live stream and going forward as you and I talk together and have this relationship and this bonding that we're having as we're learning CCNA is to avoid unnecessary crutch words. One of those being uh, <laughs> which isn't even really a word. So our objective is to understand the link state types or the, um, there we go, understand the, that's four times, understand the link, uh, the neighbor adjacency states in OSPF. And to do so, I'd like to introduce you to a little friend I have, and that is the IT elf. So let's say hello to the IT elf. I'd like you in your mind to actually say, hello, IT elf, and maybe repeat IT elf a few times, either out loud or to yourself or jot it down because the IT elf is, is a giver. Oh my gosh, he is such a giver. He is gonna give us the gift of full adjacencies in a OSPF environment. So I, the IT elf is who we have to thank for that. And it goes something like this. When there's two OSPF speakers, and let me bring up a pen here. There it is. When there's two OSPF devices that are running OSPF, and let me bring up uh, this color. Let's imagine two routers. So router one and router two. Let me just check my screen, there we go. And if these two routers are on the same segment, uh, if we bring up one, the way we would bring up OSPF on a device is we would go into router configuration mode for router OSPF, give it a process number, so it would look something like this, router OSPF, and a process number. If you haven't seen the videos on OSPF yet, please feel free to check those out, they are in the master playlist. And then once we're in router configuration mode, we then we could give it a router ID if we wanted to, or, or if we didn't want to, we don't have to, so by, by default, when we bring up OSPF, the router is going to use the configured router ID. If we don't have a configured router ID, it's going to bring up the, it's going to use the IP address on a loopback interface. If it doesn't have a loopback interface, it's going to use the highest IP address on a real interface as the router ID. And then we're going to do a network statement. So the network statement is pretty straightforward if you know how it works. <laughs> and that's that's the real secret there with OSPF is it's straightforward if you know how it works. And the way it works is this. We type in network and then we put a network statement and a wildcard mask. So if we said network 10.0.0.0 and we wanted the router to match on anything that started with 10, any interfaces, we use a wildcard mask of zero, which means we want that first number, that first octet to match. And then 255 in the rest of the wildcard mask says that we don't care about matching on the others. So this base, and then we put it into an area, area zero. So what that statement does, let me check my screen right there. Great. What that does, it tells the router, hey, here's the rules. Uh, this network statement says, look at all your interfaces. So the router says, okay, looks at all of its interfaces. Any interfaces that begin with 10, 10 anything. The wildcard mask doesn't care about matching on the second or third or fourth octet. So any interfaces that have the network 10 anything, th those are gonna be in OSPF. Great, those are in OSPF. And any directly connected networks on those interfaces are also gonna be in OSPF. So some of those interfaces that start with 10 may have a 28-bit mask, some may have a 12-bit mask, 
So it may have a 16-bit mask, but if any of those interfaces that start with 10, those respective networks that those interfaces are connected to are also gonna be in OSPF, and that's how it works. So let's talk about the neighborship and the adjacency game with these two devices. If we bring up router two, and let's for just for grins, let's imagine we have router two also configured with this same exact configuration. And just for fun, let's imagine this is the 10.10.0 network with a 24 bit mask and that R1 is dot one and R2 is dot two. If both of these routers were brought up nearly at the same time, like within 30 or 38 seconds of each other, they would basically see each other and they would see each other's hello messages and the one that has the higher router, well, the one that has the higher priority on the interface, to tell you the truth, is going to become the designated router on this broadcast network segment. So that would be, uh, the default priority is one. So if R1 has a priority one on this interface and R2 has a priority of one on that interface, that's a tie. And so if they're both booting up at the same time and they both have the same priority, it's going to be the one the higher router ID is the winner. And so R2 if it has a, and by default, if we didn't specify a router ID, this router ID would be 10.0.0.1, or sorry, 10.10.0.1, and this one would be 10.10.0.2 because that's the highest IP address it has on an interface, and so R2 with the higher router ID would win, and this would be a DR, and this would be the BDR, the backup designated router. Please check out the previous videos in this playlist for all the details on DRs and BDRs that we've discussed previously. Now, if we didn't bring these up at the same time, let me go ahead and, uh, Race that. Let's imagine we brought R1 up, and 10 minutes later, we bring up R2. R1, when it booted up originally, would say, well, there's no other designated router. It's a broadcast network. I will become the DR after a short period of time. And then when R2 comes up, it'll see that there's already a DR, and it won't bother becoming a DR. It'll say, well, uh, there's already a DR present. I don't preempt. That's the attitude of OSPF. I don't push other people out of the way. I'm a very courteous device. So as a result, R2 will see there's no DR on the BDR on the network and it will become the backup designated router if it came up after the DR had already been established on R1. So that's all well and good. And as part of that, R1 and R2 would establish what's known as a full adjacency. And I can't spell adjacency, so I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna go ahead and punt. And <laughs> I could probably pull off adjacency, but a full adjacency is what they're gonna form. And here's what a full adjacency means. A full adjacency simply means that the two routers are going to exchange their LSAs with each other and make sure they're synchronized with each other, fully adjacent. So if R1 has a link state database with several items in it and the other switch doesn't or the other router doesn't, they'll exchange LSAs and they'll get all that information synchronized. So we could look at any router, either one of them, and they would have ex all the copies of the link state advertisements. And we've talked a little bit about the link state advertisements previously, but let me just review a couple with you that are relevant for CCNA. One of those is an LSA type one. And when you think of an LSA type one, think of a router that just wants to talk about itself. That's all it wants to do. So anytime we have a router LSA, which is a type one, they, you can kind of think, I'm number one. I'm just gonna talk about myself. I'm a router LSA because that's what it does. And if we were to look at a router LSA, that router LSA would say about itself, I've got these four links, and here's the details about those four links. It's all about me. So if you have 10 routers running OSPF across your network in the same area, you're gonna have 10 type one LSAs, one for each and every router talking about themselves. The next type of LSA, that, and the only second one that you have to worry about for CCNA is an LSA type two. And an LSA type two is generated by a designated router. And the LSA type two, I'll go ahead and put uh, right here. <laughs> an LSA type two, a link state advertisement type two is generated by a designated router. So in this diagram down here with R1 being the current designated router, it would be generating the LSA type two that describes this network, which is the 10.00 network. And the it would also describe all the other routers connected to it and only the DR generates that. So the doctor generates type two LSAs that describe the network itself. And you know, we can save the other LSA types for when you get to CCNP. I mean, they're fantastic, don't get me wrong. 
LSA type threes and LSA type fives for external routes and LSA type, LSA type fours that describe how to get to an external route and then LSA type sevens for a not so stubby area. What a, what a fun thing to do, but not yet, not yet. In CCNA, all we have is LSA type ones to deal with and LSA type twos because they're focusing on a single area OSPF. So how do we synchronize those a full adjacency represents that two routers have fully synchronized all their data with each other. And there are some relationship steps that go into these neighbors becoming fully adjacent and having exact replicas of the link state database on each of the routers. Now, link state database is a fancy way of saying a collection of all the link state advertisements in the area. So an OSPF in a single area, it's going to be a collection of router LSAs, type ones, and the designated router generated network LSAs, and that's it. So let me clear the screen off here, and let's talk about the dating game <laughs> with Cisco devices when they're establishing a neighbor relationship. And we'll use router one and router two again. And here are the steps. In fact, let's just, uh, yeah, well, you know what, I'm gonna clear that off. Let's just use one router and just talk it, let's talk about it from one router's perspective. So here's our router one. The first state that it's going to be in, and I guess I will, I will punt. I'll put him over here. The first uh, neighbor state that we're going to have is down. <laughs> Meaning, I've got no neighbors. It's so lonely out here. I am so alone. There's no neighbors whatsoever. And the next neighbor state is going to go ahead and be init. Now, let me tell you what causes router one to get so excited and be in an init state. It sees a hello message, which are sent in OSPF, it sees a hello message coming from another router on that same segment. So they're both connected to the same network segment. And there's a hello message that R2 generates, and R1 sees it and says, I'm not alone. It's like Castaway, like uh, Tom Hanks. I'm not alone. I've got whatever the volleyball head name was. <laughs> um, so he sees this hello message, and in the hello message, it doesn't identify anybody else on that network segment, which means that R2 is sending a hello but normally, on a good day, after you've been there for a few moments, R2 would normally send a hello message that includes the other router IDs that are on that segment. So when R1 sees a hello message and it sees, oh, it's a hello from R2, it's happy, but it doesn't, R1 doesn't see its own router ID inside of that hello message. So it says, well, okay, this could be, this could be promising. <laughs> that's the init state. And that's how we get into the init state with the neighborship is that we see a hello message, but we are not included in it. Well, a few moments later, because R2 is a good speaker, he sends a hello message and it includes R1's router ID in it. Basically, it's R2 saying, hey, uh, here's a hello message and here's all the other devices I know on this network segment. And when R2, when R1 sees that, that second hello, with, <laughs> which includes the R1 router ID, it goes to something called two-way, which is a two-way state. That basically means bi-directional. Uh, Router 2 and Router 1 are both sending hello messages. They're both including each other router ID in that router, in that hello message, and that puts them in the two-way state. Now, a two-way state is not considered to be fully adjacent because two-way just simply says, yeah, I know you're out there. That's what it means. It's like a count. Like if there was 10 routers and they were all in the two-way state, we would know there's nine other routers, but we wouldn't be exchanging database information with them or link state information with them. We wouldn't be sharing um, if we, they were just in the two-way state. So it's at this point in our journey where these devices decide, okay, I see you, you see me, should we go further? You know, like dating, you know, should we get engaged or should we continue dating or should we see other people? Lots of choices here. Well, in the two-way state, <laughs> if there's no DR and no BDR, in there, there's also gonna be some negotiation about, hey, somebody should be the DR for this segment and BDR for this segment. That's another little side discussion they're gonna have. But if there is no other DR or BDR and they wanna continue the relationship, they're gonna go ahead and say, let's take the next step. There's no DR or you're the DR and there's no BDR. Let's take the next step and let's go ahead and work our way to becoming fully adjacent. And that next step is called the X start state. Now, what is an X start state? Well, an X start state is sort of like I guess it's a lot like dating. You know, your two people are dating and they might tell each other a little bit about each other, like, hey, how many siblings do you have? 
like two or three or <laughs> or more. <laughs> or they may say, you know, where'd you grow up? I grew up here. But it's not it's not the whole story. It's not like where you went to high school, what kind of grades you got, uh, the names of your brothers and sisters and siblings and so forth. It's kind of like a little, um, the exchange is going to be a summary. But to get that going, they need to negotiate in a couple, a couple's relationship. They need to negotiate who's going to go first. Like, uh, I'd like to share some information with you, just like a high-level overview, but you want to share with me first or should I share with you first? Think of it that way because that's what XSTART is. XSTART is negotiating who's going to start telling the other person information first. And so they enter this XSTART state and then they agree who's first. I'll just put who's first. So that's XSTART. Now, I also, along with another E, is the exchange date because it comes right after. So I'd lump those together, E X. C-H-A-N-G-E. And here's how exchange state works. We're going to send database descriptors, sometimes called DD or DBD. Wow, fancy, fancy term for this is where they're sharing a high-level overview of I grew up in California or I have a few siblings or here's some high-level details about me. And what these routers are doing, they're actually exchanging the high-level details about the link states they have in their database. Like if one of them has 28 router LSAs in the area, it can say, hey, I know about these 28 router LSAs. It's not, the, all the, it's not all the data in those LSAs. It's just describing that I've got these. And so those will go each direction. So router one and router two will share with each other that they have a certain quantity of LSAs. Maybe one's got some LSA type twos, the other has some LSA type ones. And if they match, if they're all synchronized, that's great. But if they're not, because one router just came up or there's, uh, yeah, one router just came up on the network is a great example. The next stage is loading. And that's right here, L-O-A-D-I-N-G. And loading involves asking and receiving. Asking and receiving. So it goes, <laughs> so it goes something like this. If the two devices, they went through the X start, they said, who goes first? And they agreed on that. And then they go through the exchange state where they're saying, okay, here's what I, here's what I have. Here's my, uh, an overview of my LSAs. And they share that with each other based on the order they said they were going to talk in. Then what happens if somebody is lacking? Like, oh my gosh, you've got these 28 LSAs for routers. I only have 22. Can you send me the ones I need? And that's called a link state request. And what's the other site going to do? It's going to go ahead and do a link state update. It's going to advertise those over to the other router. And that ref that's referred to as loading. And that's the loading process with OSPF. And that's another neighbor state. And that only takes a few moments in high-speed networks today. And after that's done, we are then in a full state. We have a full adjacency. And a full adjacency simply means that we are going to send updates. If something changes, I'm going to tell my fully adjacent neighbor and give him that information. I want to make sure he has it. And if he already has it, great. We can verify that. I just want to make sure we're synchronized. Fully adjacent means that we're doing full updates. So if we take a look at this, the init two-way X start and exchange, which basically go right back to back together, loading in full, here's how I want this guy, the IT elf, to help us remember that process. Because that, my friends, is the mnemonic. The IT for two-way. E for exchange and X start and exchange, L for loading, and F for full. The IT help. <laughs> the IT help will help you remember the states that two neighbors can go through on their way to becoming fully adjacent. The IT help. Uh, it could have been worse. <laughs> well, I thought, you know, if I if I come out front with the IT help and I share that with you and I have you say that a few times. When it comes, push comes to shove in a production environment, when you're working with OSPF and you're looking at the states for neighbors and you see, oh, it's in the two-way state or it's in X start or we're stuck loading or, for, or whatever the state is, you can know exactly where that comes in the negotiation in the path. This is also appropriate. These states are also appropriate for, um, for there goes another, um, there goes, it's appropriate for a broadcast network where you don't have to define neighbors. If we had a non-broadcast network, we had to do neighbor statements. There's also another state could be called attempt, which means, hey, I sent out a unicast over to this guy and uh, haven't heard back and haven't seen my information coming back from him. But for most networks, because we don't have a lot of 
unicast uh, neighbor statements in OSPF anymore because of our current topologies. Those are the statements. The IT elf init, two-way, xstart, exchange, loading, and full adjacency. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna confess I had a lot of fun making that up. All right. So what I thought we had to do is we had to apply some of this and see how real it gets. And it gets pretty stinking real. And that's another good reinforcement of education and learning is that we can only understand the concepts. We can also see it in action. I thought to myself, self, I've got these this beautiful topology that I've used a couple times for spanning tree, but these devices, they're multi-layer switches. So I thought, why don't we, let me move that away for a second. Why don't we go ahead and leverage that and actually carve out, they all have VLAN 10 on them. So let's say VLAN 10, I do cancel there. I need to go to this layer, there we go. Let's go to VLAN 10. And VLAN 10 is a layer two thing. And if you haven't seen those videos yet on layer two and switching and trunking in the master playlist, please take advantage of those and have fun. I hope you do. Um, so there's. There's another, <clears throat> there's another $5 out of my pocket. All right. So we're going to use VLAN 10, and that has the IP address space of 10.10.0.0 with a 24-bit mask. And what we can do is we can supply and implement layer 3 routing on all of these multi-layer switches. And we'll do that through interface VLAN 10. And we'll use the IP addresses of 10.10.0. Uh, and we'll use are for router number and from a multi-layer switch perspective that's gonna be an the like switch number one would be one and switch number three would be th dot three and so forth and if we get all these up what we're gonna have is this we're gonna have like five routers these multi-layer switches one two three four and five and they're all sitting in the same vlan so logically they're gonna look like this oh oh prepare yourself this is gonna be way fun and if we enable these VLAN interfaces, these layer three interfaces, and then we enable OSPF, we can see the adjacency show up and, and we can have an opportunity to remind ourselves about who becomes fully adjacent with who, because that's also very, very important to remember that in an OSPF network with one segment, an ethernet segment, where there's five routers, or five multi-layer switches in this case, they're not all gonna go for the full adjacency. And that's because we're gonna have a DR and the second device will be a BDR. And then all the other devices in our topology, the other three devices, they'll establish full adjacencies with the DR and BDR for sure. But you know what they do with everybody else? If they're a DR other and they have a full adjacency with the DR and the BDR, the other two switches, they're just going to go ahead and leave themselves in the two-way state. That's where they're dating. <laughs> they, they had the init state. They saw the two-way. They see their router ID and the other person's hellos but they don't proceed past that. They decide, you know what? We're going to we're going to hold this relationship at a two-way and that way we're not going to go all the way through the x start exchange loading in full. We don't need to. We only need a full adjacency with the DR and the BDR. And we have an opportunity right here <laughs> to go ahead and see that. So let's do it. Let's put that plan into action. And I've got a topology somewhere that I can bring up. There it is. And we'll take uh, Q and A after we verify this and demo it. We'll hang around. We'll do some Q and A as well, so you can ask questions regarding, hopefully, regarding the topics we're focused on here, or really much anything in CCNA. So with switch one, we'll just show IP interface brief. Wow, <laughs> uh, this is going to be a slow start here because there's there's uh, there's no layer three interfaces. Uh, that are set. All right, we can fix that. We have the ability to create interface VLAN X. Let's first of all verify if we have any VLANs. Show VLAN brief. And we do. Okay, so we've got uh, five VLANs, VLAN 1, 10, 20, 30, and 40. And we are ne we're gonna need to create interface VLAN 10. That's a switched virtual interface, a logical layer three interface on each of these devices. And to do that, I suggest that we use one of my favorite tools of all time. And here it is. That's it, Notepad. It's a winner. All right, let's go to Format, and we'll go to Font, and I'll make it a little bit bigger so we can all see it easily. That will work. And we're gonna use the same commands over and over and over again. So short of using network automation tools and scripts, I'm just gonna use Notepad and do some copy-paste. So we'll go into configuration mode on each of these devices, these multi-layer switches. 
will create interface VLAN 10 on each of those devices. So far, so good. And then we'll bring them up. I'm going to do a no shutdown on each of those interfaces because on these switches, a new switched virtual interface is down by default. So that'll bring it up. And then we'll give the IP address of 10.10 .10 based on our plan 0.x <laughs> with a 25 with a 24 bit mask and that's how we spell 24 bits in dotted decimal if you need to brush up or need to revisit or learn uh, dotted decimal and ip subnetting there's a separate track and it's part of the master playlist as well so please take advantage of that and then i'm going to go ahead and copy that just like that but I'm not copying it all the way to the end, so it won't put a hard return there. Right click, copy, and then we'll go to switch one, and just boom, and switch two, boom, switch three, boom, four, boom, five, boom. I'm just right clicking to paste that in. And then once we're there, I'll go ahead and just back up a little bit and replace on switch one with dot one. So now the layer three interface for interface VLAN 10 on switch one is 10.10.0.1. Fantabulous. Then we'll go to switch two, We'll do the same thing. Done. And then we'll go to switch three, do the same thing. And switch four. Oh, this is getting fun now. <laughs> this is saving us a little typing, which is helpful. And switch five. And five. OK, and then we can test this too. We can try pings. So if we wanted to ping, what we should have is we should, I think what we have is a interface VLAN 10 on each and every switch. There's trunks between all the switches. So VLAN 10 is being carried everywhere. And we should be able to ping from switch to switch on that same local network. And I say switch, these multi-layer switches. So let's try that. We'll do a ping. Oh, you want to see something interesting? Let's do something interesting. Let me do, do enable. All right, let's do a debug of ARP because I would like to share with you something that has perplexed many people for many, many years. And that is, why does a Cisco router always time out on its first packet if it hasn't resolved ARP? <laughs> and and uh, that's a good question. I don't know if I have the answer for that, but I can show you what's happening. And maybe that can relieve some of the pressure. So if we do a ping to 10, let's first of all verify our IP address. Show IP interface brief. Right, show IP route. So we believe we are directly connected to the 10.10.0 network, fantastic. And let's ping 10.10.0. And let's pick two, he's real close. Actually, they're all, they're, just, they're all just a little layer two address away. So you notice how it failed the first one? We only got four out of five back. And that's because it does this thing. So the Cisco router, what it does, or multi-layer switch in this case, if it doesn't have an entry in the ARP cache, it has this method that internally thinks, oh, incomplete entry. It didn't even try, really try, sending out the first ICMP message for the ping request. It just kind of got consumed while it created this incomplete entry. And then once the ARP resolved, then it was able to go ahead and send out this packet. So now it's in the ARP cache. So we do a show ARP. There's the ARP cache. And now that 10.10.0.2 is in the ARP cache, we have no problem. We can go ahead and just ping again, there won't be a, a drop on that very first packet. But that's consistent, pretty consistent across many Cisco routing devices. So that's a thing. So let's go ahead and do the arrest. We'll do three, timeout on the first. Oh, and I still have debug on, so that's gonna give us all that information. Let's do a undebug all. And then we'll go for four. And for five just to verify our baseline of connectivity before we start enabling OSPF. Okay, so great success so far. We've got interface layer three interfaces, and now let's set up OSPF starting on switch number one. Also, while we do this, let's do a debug of IP OSPF, and let's see what options we have. Now, debugs are interesting. Debugs can give us a lot of feedback and sometimes too much feedback. So we could do debug IP OSPF packet, that's an option, but I think I'd like to do a debug IP OSPF adjacency. That'll show us a lot of the information regarding the neighbor states as neighbors start to form adjacencies and go to a full adjacencies. So let's do that. We'll do a debug IP OSPF adjacency. And with that running, we'll then go to configuration mode. And 
you know, I'll, let's do this too. I'm going to use Notepad again because many of these commands are going to be so repetitive. So we'll do a config t, router, OSPF, process ID 1, a network statement. And we'll do, we could do this. We could do 10.10.0.0 with a wildcard mask of 0 .0 0.0.255.255. That would work. We could put it into area 0. Or we could say 10.0. 0, 0 with a wildcard mask with three octets that we don't care about matching. So I just wanted to point out that the logic here is the same as it has been with OSPF network statements. If you haven't seen that video, that stream on OSPF network statements, check it out. It'll explain the various options. But the process is you put the network statement in. The router, in this case, is only going to care about matching on interfaces that begin with 10. Any interfaces that do begin with 10 are going to be assigned, are going to be associated with OSPF in area 0 along with any networks that those interfaces are connected to, whether they're 12 bits or 16 bits or 29 bits or 32, <laughs> that'd be a loopback, or 31 bits, or in the case of a loopback, 32 bits. All right, and let's do this, router dash ID, and we'll specify a router ID, which we'll replace when we go to each one. So if everybody's okay with that, I'm gonna copy and paste, save us a little bit of time, starting here on R1, so we'll go to router configuration mode, router ID, and Oh, I've got, a, I've got a question for you. Based on this router, let's do a do show IP, um, do show IP interface brief. Okay, great. Based on this router right now, if, well, we've already done it. I've already brought up OSPF. Um, can somebody tell me what the router ID is going to be on this router right now? All we did was bring up router OSPF1. We gave it a network statement and that's it. I'm very curious if someone can tell me before we hard code a router ID, what would be the router ID on this device? So I'll look at those chats here in just a moment. I'm sure they're pouring in. Let me go ahead and hard code this. Let's do a router ID. And I want this router ID to be 1111. So that's going to be the router ID going forward. It'll be very easy to see. Switch one will be router ID 111. Fantastic. Okay. And let me take a look at the, the feedback here. And there is a little bit of a delay on the uh, the live stream. So the answer to that question would be, regarding what would the router ID be, the router ID would be the highest IP address on a loopback. There are no loopbacks. <laughs> uh, or the highest IP address on a real interface, and that would be 10.10.0.1. So until I hard-coded this, the router ID was going to be 10.10.0.1, based on this gear that we're looking at live. All right. Next, let's bring up our next neighbor. I'm going to leave debug running on switch one, and let's go to switch two, and let's bring up OSPF. So we'll go into configuration. Actually, we can just copy paste some of that again. So here uh, we will specify, mm, let me do, yeah, let's do this. Let's copy that and go to switch two and paste that. And I want the router ID to be 2.2.2.2. Great. And it's saying I need to do clear IP OSPF process for that to take effect. But let's do a show IP OSPF. Yeah, sure enough. Look at that. It wants to, I should have set the router ID first before I did that because it wants me to reset the router process. So I am going to leave that. Mm, will, it, will this blow up my router? Maybe. Uh, let me, I'm going to leave that at 10.10.0.2 for this switch. Uh, I don't want to reload the OSPF process or clear it. And let's go back to switch one. And let's take a look at the output here. Come on, switch one and switch two. You need to play nice. So what we're expecting on switch two is we're expecting a neighbor state, a fully adjacent state on this device. Wow, look at that. I think when I change the uh, router ID after, I'll clear it. I'll play by the rules. If it blows... <laughs> If it blows up, it blows up. That's life. All right. Okay, here we go. All right. That wasn't so painful. So clear IP OSPF processes just basically says reset it. And now if we do a do uh, show IP OSPF, now it should show us the router ID, which is the one we just set with the router ID command. So I'm going to go to my notepad and I'm going to do that first. Well, I guess I can't do the network anymore. All right. I can live with that. In fact, I may just type it in. It's only two lines. 
Okay, so if we do a show IP OSPF interface brief, we've got an interface right here, VLAN 10. It's currently in a wait state. Oh, check it out. Let's go to switch one. Show IP OSPF interface brief. Oh, this isn't good. This is not this is not good. This is like OSPF troubleshooting that I wasn't expecting to have happen here. But it is. It's happening. And then part of it was because they changed the router ID and then they reset the OSPF process. So these guys are duking it out and the debug is showing what's happening. These are database descriptors. So if we wanted to know what phase they're in, the database descriptors, when they're sending those, that's part of the X start state or the exchange state where they're showing their or sending their uh, database descriptors. Oh, finally. Thank you. Um, okay. Well, I'm glad you came up. I am very happy. Yeah, I had a clean up database exchange. So we can pick these out. I wasn't planning on this lengthy of a of a discussion on on the neighborships, but it will it will reinforce what we're talking about. Okay. We'll start right here. And let me bring out a pen. OSPF. Love it, love it, love it. And my pen is right <laughs> my pen is right here. Okay, so this is right here the Oh, did it pop up? I need I'm going to turn off debugging so it doesn't keep scrolling off my screen. One moment. So we'll do an undebug all and leave that off. And then I can go back and it won't interrupt my screen as we talk about what's going on here. All right. Starting up here, back to the discussion at hand. All right. Starting up here, we have the two-way state. So initially, there was an init state. And that init state was happening when this route, the switch, switch one, was seeing hello messages come in, but it didn't include router one's router ID in them. And so that was the init. The moment that we started seeing from switch two, the hello messages that included the router ID that said, hey, in the in the uh, hello messages, the router ID, router one's switch one's router ID was included. That's that's what went to two A. And then it just got nasty. So they did some DR and BDR election stuff. That's fine. <laughs> and then it just didn't go clean after that. So we can just, we have the debug running, so we can actually look through this. So if we go down a little bit further, the next thing we would expect to find is X start. Once they figure out that they want to actually um, be neighbors, here we go. So after a period of waiting a little bit, they then went to X start. And right here, they're sending, in, they're negotiating who's going to go first. So one of these devices. One, that would be the one that ends up as the master. He goes first. And then they go to exchange. And so in exchange, they're exchanging these database descriptors so they can find out exactly what's in the other's database and if they're missing something. And then once they are, then they go to loading, which is right here. And loading is when we're requesting. So here's a link state request. And then there's sending of link and then there's sending of link state updates right here. Let me back out that one little highlight. There we go. And that's the loading, and then they finally ended up in full. Normally, I gotta tell you, normally <laughs> that doesn't take like it was normally what should happen is you bring up one router, let it become the DR, which we did, and then with you don't play in shenanigans, you bring up the second one and it will see that there's a DR present. It won't wait very long. They'll negotiate, go through two way to X start to exchange to loading to full, and you won't have any problem. But the debug here was able to help us identify they had some challenges along the way. I don't know what those were, but I'm sure I caused a lot of them by changing the router ID halfway through the mix. All right, and oh, then I cleared the IP OSPF process. So that also probably caused a little bit of grief that caused us to go a little bit sideways. All right, well, there, there's a reinforcement though of them. And let's bring up another router and we'll actually take a look and see what the results are when we bring up a third router. In fact, I'm gonna turn debugging back on. Let's see who's who. Show IP OSPF interface brief. Okay, so switch one is the BDR, and that was due to the reset that we did. And so switch two is the DR then. So IP OSPF neighbors. So there's good old R switch two. He is the designated router, and we have a full adjacency. That's what this means. Also, what this means up here, this is referring to the how many neighbors are we adjacent with fully. That's the F right here. So this, this thing should be moved over like uh, an inch to the right to line up under FC, <laughs> but that first one means we have a one full adjacency and the second one represents the count 
how many devices or how many OSPF speakers do we see on that network segment. So we see one and we're fully adjacent with that one, but that's about to change with Switch 3 being brought to the picture. So here's what's gonna happen, or here's what we expect to happen with Switch 3. Switch 3 is gonna come on board. It's gonna say, hey, on network VLAN 10, there's a DR, there's a BDR, I don't need to be either, so my role on this network will be a DR other. And it'll show up as a DR other, and it will form an adjacency, a full adjacency with the DR, and it'll form a full adjacency with the backup designated router. And then if there's other DR, uh, if there's other druthers on that same network segment, DR others, it will just simply go to two-way with those other devices and not continue on to a full adjacency. That's what I expect to have happen. Let's turn on debugging on, let's go back to, let's go back to switch one. Let's see, who's the DR? The DR is now switch two. Let's go to switch two. We'll enable debugging for OSPF adjacencies. We'll bring up switch three as an OSPF speaker on that network, and then we can go back and look at the debugs to confirm the states again, which should be from init to two-way, then to X start, exchange, loading, and full. That's our prediction. <laughs> I guess I should say that's my prediction. <laughs> and yours too. All right, let's do this thing. So we're gonna go into router. Oh, I'm turning on debug. So switch two is the DR. Just to confirm, great. And debug IP OSPF adjacencies, fantastical. And we'll go to switch three and router OSPF one. I'll specify the router ID first this time, which is gonna be 3333, because I don't wanna use the highest IP address with 101003. And then we'll specify network 0000, 000 space 255.255.255.255. .255 now what that's gonna do one, two, three, four. That is gonna bring in the 10 networks. It's also going to bring in any other networks that may show up in the future. <laughs> area, area zero, all right. Also, one little thing, this is kind of a nasty, if you put in network 0000, and then you also use a wildcard mask of 0000, this is not for CCNA certification testing, but you should know it'll flip those for you. It's gonna. It's gonna say, oh, you meant to say wildcard mask all on. Uh, it flips it for you automatically. So we are fully adjacent with the DR, which is 2222, and we're fully adjacent with the BDR, which is 1111. We can verify that with the show IP interface brief. And uh, I should just throw in there an IP OS, <laughs> I should throw in there, ha old habits die hard. Show IP OSPF interface brief, that'll be good. And it shows us here that we are, on that interface, we are a druther meaning a DR other, not the DR, not the BDR. We see two neighbors on that network segment and we are fully adjacent with two neighbors and we see a count of two. So we are fully adjacent with the DR and the BDR. If we just show IP OSPF neighbors, there we go. So there's our adjacency with, our full adjacency with the DR, DR and our full adjacency with the BDR. Let's bring on one more, then it gets really interesting. So we'll go to switch four. now. Let's think about this together before we put it in. Switch four, when it comes online, it's going to see hello messages from a lot of devices, including switch one, two, and three. It's gonna realize from those from the negotiations that hey, there's a DR present, it's switch two, there's a BDR present, it's switch one, there's a DR other, and then switch four is gonna form a full adjacency with the DR, switch two, and the BDR, switch one. And it's gonna remain in the two-way state with switch three, because it doesn't need to form a full adjacency. That's why we have DRs and BDRs on the network segment, is so we don't have to have a full adjacency of every device to every other device on the same network segment. So let's prove that out. So here on switch four, we'll go into configuration mode for router OSPF, process ID one. We'll give it a router ID up front of 4444, and then we'll specify network 0000, and Okay, will you forgive me if I do this? <laughs> I hope you do. I'm gonna put in zero, 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 area zero, just so you can see the reality of the situation. Do show IP protocols. Check this out. It flipped all the bits for us right here. I just wanted to let you know that it's flipping the bits. So the right way to do it, if you're taking an exam, is use a wildcard mask as it was intended with the bits on for the bits you don't care about matching. And so if you don't do that. In some versions of iOS, it will go ahead and flip them for you, but not the best practice. 
tell the device what you intend to do. So if we look at our show IP OSPF interface brief, we should have one I one interface in OSPF, which is the VLAN 10 interface. Its role is a DR other, and there's we have two full adjacencies. Again, that's what this F up here is for. But we have three other routers on the network, and that's because switch three, we are not a fully adjacent neighbor with. We're in the two-way state. That's where we stopped. We stopped dating. So sad. So sad. Show IP OSPF neighbor, and there it is. So we're in the two-way state, and it's other. And the thing, the reason that this is actually pretty darn important is because. In production networks, if you have more than three or four devices on a network segment running OSPF, you're going to have these. And so it's important to see and realize, oh, is that a problem? Is that okay? Why is that a, Why is that happening? And now we know. It's because the only full adjacencies on the same network segment are going to be between the DR and the BDR with each other. They're fully synchronized. They're full adjacent. And the DR and BDR and every other OSP, OSPF speaker on that same network segment. And then beyond that, we're going to have just two-way states between all the DR others and other DR others. And this reveals that as well. Um, I think that's that's another $5 um, referring to the um. That's what I wanted to cover. I wanted to address the, ish, the, uh, the statement of the IT elf being able to help us identify the states that can be gone through or will be gone through when two neighbors become fully adjacent on their way. And it starts with down, which isn't really too much even worth mentioning because there's no neighbor. And then it goes to init, which means, hey, I saw hello message, but it, they, don't, they don't know about me yet. And then it goes to two-way when I see the hello and they include my router ID as being aware, being alive on that network segment. And then we negotiate who's going to share information first. And that's the X start. And then the exchange. The person who said they're going to go first does a little overview of all their LSAs. That's the exchange date, and they do it back and forth, and those are acknowledged, making sure that each one of them got it. And then if there's missing pieces, they then go to the loading state, which is requesting updates and then receiving updates to have fully synchronized OSPF databases. And that's how full adjacencies work in OSPF. So here's what I would love to do. Thank you very much for joining me for this live stream. I, Based on feedback, I've made a couple tweaks. I think you might like them. One is that, Keith, we'd love to keep the Q&A that you do after your live streams. We'd love to keep that as a recording so that people could go back and watch it and listen to it. And I thought to myself, I talked to a few people, and I agree that sometimes we go to conferences and sessions and the, the content's fun and, and useful. But in addition, And in addition to that, it's also useful to hear the Q&A after and hear people's questions. So I'd like to turn it over to... I guess I won't do closing music because we're going to stay right here. In fact, let me do this. I'm going to get a little sip of water. So I will play some closing music, but stick around for a few moments. And if you have questions regarding CCNA 200301 or even the one that's expiring here in like five days, uh, that'd be fine as well. But I'd like you to, if you have questions for me, type them in. I'm not going to be able to scroll through the whole history of all the questions. But if you have questions you'd like to ask regarding the topic today, which is OSPF neighbor states or anything in CCNA, Go ahead and do an at Keith Barker so it shows up for me. It'll be on my screen in yellow so I can very easily see it. And then I'll focus on those. And that way, for those individuals who are helping other people and answering those questions, I won't be jumping in midstream in a conversation. And that way I can make sure I answer those questions. So I'm going to go ahead and put some closing music on, music on for a few moments. I'll be right back and we'll jump into some live Q&A. Thanks, everybody. you're putting in All your hopes and efforts are all in vain Who will pick you up when you've lost everything All right, and I'm back for Q&A. Thank you very much. I I had a fun time in the stream. I'm glad you joined me for. I'm looking at the count. We're uh Pretty solid number, and I'm grateful. I'm grateful. So let me. So my Q and A questions are right there, and I guess I could flip that camera in the future or move them over here. Anyway, if I'm looking down here, I'm looking at the the Q and A. 
So again, any new questions, please uh, repeat them so that I can make sure that I see them. And I don't see any questions. Oh, there we go. Okay. There's a little bit of a delay. Thank you for that. Um, I thought you had to enable routing on a layer three uh, switch and prefer and no switch port. That is a fantastic question. Let's talk about that. If not every multi-layer switch is created equal, in fact, not every switch is created equal in, in the Cisco environment. So if you have a, a multi-layer switch, if, if you want to do routing for other devices, you have to do IP routing to enable it. Now, once that's enabled, IP, um, make sure I've got your question here. Once that's enabled on a multi-layer switch, you just create SVI, switched virtual interfaces, which we did in this lab. We just created interface VLAN 10, poof, we have this logical layer three interface. Think of it like a room with no exit door, no router interface. And then when we, let's just call it VLAN 10, this big room, all the devices are in it chatting amongst themselves. But if we want a default gateway, we can do an interface VLAN 10 for that room. And it's like a door showing up in that room that has an IP address. And then clients can use that IP address as their default gateway. And then the switch with its switched virtual interface will logically do layer three routing on its behalf, on that client's behalf. So creating the SVI is a layer three interface that allows us to do logical layer three routing on a multi-layer switch. It's pretty cool. There's also a, a video on inter VLAN routing with a multi-layer switch in the playlist. So I encourage you to check that one out too. It goes through detail and de detail step-by-step -step how to do that. So look at that one. And the other option, which you mentioned, which is really a good one to be aware of, is that if we take an interface on a switch, a multi-layer switch, and say no switch port, it becomes as if it's a layer three routed interface. And that also works. So if we want to do a physical interface this time, not a switch virtual interface, but a physical interface, we could go to interface gig two slash two or two slash three or whatever the interface was, say no switch port, and poof, it's now a layer three interface. And you could connect that to wherever you want to connect it to another switch or to a router or to another device as a layer three interface that would have its own IP address. So great questions. And let me uh, peek here. All right, I'm having, I need to highlight these a little better than I am. So let me do that. Okay, um, thank you for that pause. Uh, Chris is asking, Keith, hey, this is, is there a difference between using network statements in the routing process for, versus using IP OSPF area on the interface? Yes, great. Well, great question. So two ways we can enable OSPF in our routers and on their interfaces. One is the network statement. So we use a network statement with a company wildcard mask in an area. And then the router looks at all of its interfaces and says, okay, which ones match based on the, the, the network statement. And it includes those in OSPF, including the networks that those interfaces are connected to. That's fantastic. Works like a charm. If you have lots of interfaces or you're adding new ones in the future, makes a lot of sense because you don't have to worry about manually adding another uh, network statement if you are adding another interface that's in the 10 network or whatever the network statement covers. The other option is to go to the interface and do interface configuration for it. And the way you can... So if you, if you have just a interface that needs to belong to OSPF and you don't want to use a network statement for that specific interface, you can just use the interface command to enable OSPF for that process ID on that interface. And the way to verify that is you can use a show IP OSPF interface and give the interface name, and that will show you how that interface was brought into OSPF, including was it brought in from an interface command or from a network statement. So uh, as far as the end result, the functionality, identical. It doesn't change the thing, just two different ways of doing it. Okay. Ayer is saying OSPF versus IBGP. Why would I today use OSPF over internal BGP? So B, great question. OSPF is uh, considered to be an interior gateway routing protocol inside of a routing domain. And BGP, border gateway protocol, whether it's within an autonomous system, that's IBGP, or between autonomous systems, that's external BGP, is more industrial and does has different fun it doesn't converge nearly as fast it's very very slow compared to ospf uh, oh, bgp is not link state so there are some creative solutions that service providers use with bgp 
uh, including MPLS Layer 3 VPNs and other options to get customers' traffic from point A to point B. But inside of an organization, unless you're doing something creative, I think I, there are a few cases that I've heard of where people are using internal BGP, but they're using it as part of a Layer 3 VPN solution, which is a little bit of CC natal. But so in a production environment, unless you had a business case or a need for some functionality that was supported by border gateway protocol, you'd want to use a traditional IGP, inter interior gateway protocol, such as OSPF. So BGP covers a lot of really good ground, including you can route, you can share IPv4 information with address families, IPv6 information, VPN routes, and some other cool stuff that OSPF can't do on its own. So usually people who are running BGP have OSPF as well to train BGP on how to reach endpoints because BGP peers with IP addresses and not directly connected neighbors. And as a result, if you have two BGP speakers on the sides of your network, there needs to be a routing protocol inside like OSPF or something similar like ISIS that can actually tell one BGP speaker how to reach the IP address to peer with the other one. So BGP peers with a TCP at layer four. It doesn't peer just based on a directly connected neighbor. So OSPF has its own protocol at layer four. So does EIGRP where BGP uses TCP to get across. And then Frank is asking, how soon before CBT Nuggets has the new CCNP? We're working on it. We're working on it. Uh, it's a five, five trainer collaboration, five amazing trainers. Uh, Network Chuck, Jeremy Chara, Jeff Kish, Knox Hutchinson, and myself. And we all have our parts and pieces. And I, this is an official broadcast from CBT about when it will be done. But I'm thinking perhaps by the end of March, everything will be complete and ready to go. And then we'll go on to the next concentration exam. And then beyond that, some of the security stuff with firepower and other options that uh, I have interest in as well. So Matthew, you are welcome. Thank you for that. Are there any other questions that you'd like to ask about CCNA related topics or about link state or um, OSPF neighbor states, which is was the focus today? I also had another request on some LSA types that Again, for CCNA, the LSA types are just going to be type 1, which is describing a Cisco router itself, and an LSA type 2. In fact, if you'd like to see them, let me, let me show you, based on our lab we did, what that would look like. So if we bring up our lab again, which is pretty cool to see, and I will re-authenticate here. Let's do, let's use, did we bring up switch 5? No. But if we brought up switch five, it would just be another DR other, not too exciting. So we do a show IP OSPF database. That's a good one. So show IP OSPF database is going to show us the, the link state database in OSPF. And everybody in the same area should have exactly the same database. So if we go to switch one and we do that command and we go to switch two, which I will turn off debugging on and do that command. And let's get into these real quick and then we'll come back and look at, ah. Oh. I, I want to do them exactly lined up so you can see exactly how identical they are. So let me just do that without pressing enter. A little nervous tick in my left hand as I pressed enter too much. Boom, and one more. Boom, nice, nice. All right, so I've done the show IP OSPF database command on each of the routers. Now, what that means, very simply, is that this is us asking the router, hey, can you show me all the LSAs, the collection of LSAs that you have regarding OSPF? And switch one said, sure, here they are. And it organizes them numerically. Type ones first, followed by type twos. And then if there's area border routers and external routes and so forth, it'll be followed by threes and fours and fives, maybe some sevens if you have um, NSSA areas. But in our case, it's just router LSAs type ones and summary our network LSAs type twos. And so here are the type ones. These are the router link states, the LSA type ones for router one, router two, router three, multi-layer switch two and three, and device with the router ID of 4444. And then in our topology, because we have one network segment, we only have one specific designated router and that is router two. So the link ID is the IP address on that interface of router two, the designated router. And he is advertising the details about that network segment. So as an example, we could ask for detail. This is, and it's the same one on each one. If we go switch two, look, same, same, 
same. <laughs> the checksums match, the sequence numbers match. Because it's a link state database, every link state database in the area for that area is going to be identical on each and every switch, or in this case, every routing device that's running OSPF, in this case, the multi-layer switches, which is pretty darn cool. So we could actually do these from any, any switch. We could do a show IP OSPF database. And let's look at the router LSAs. And let's look at it for 1.1.1.1. In English, this is saying, please show me the LSA type 1, the router LSA, for the LSA with the link ID of 1111, which is the router ID of R1. So here's what R1 knows about. <laughs> R1 says, yep, I know about this network. The, uh, where is the network? This, I'm sorry, here's the interface. Oh, it's just, a, it's, just the, it's, not the, it's just a type one. So it has one link and here's its IP address. Uh, router interface address 10.10.0.1. Oh, you know, I'm on switch four. I'm looking at the LSA for router one. I'm saying, why are you claiming to have 10.10.0.1? <laughs> because I'm looking, we're looking at the router LSA for router one. So this is router one's information. The advertising router is router one. There's his IP address 10.10.0.1. There's the designated router for the segment. And if we wanted to look at the designated router information, the LSA type two, let's do a show, IP OSPF database again, and let's ask for the network uh, LSA for 10.10.0.2. So we do a show, IP OSPF database, and then we'll say that we want network, which means LSA type twos generated by a designated router. And then we only have one. So we could just press enter here and it would just show us that one. So this is the designated router who generated this, and the link state ID is the actual IP address of the designated router, which is R2's address on that Ethernet segment. And it says, hey, connected, there's this network, and it's 101002 is my address. It's a 24-bit mask, meaning it's the 1010 network. And here's the four other attached devices to that network. Actually, Oh, we only have four, sorry. That's all four, including R2 itself, who's the designated router. So it, it gets it's easier to start off with not a lot of LSAs, meaning just type ones and type twos, and be comfortable with them. And I would encourage you as you're labbing this up and practicing, uh, just be aware that a quick show IP OSPF database in single area OSPF is only gonna have two types, LSA types one, which is the router, and LSA type twos, which is the DR's advertisements for a common network segment. And then that, link state database of all that information will be identical across the entire OSPF area. So every OSPF speaker is going to have that information. So let me take a peek at, at the other questions. Also, if you need more information on OSPF, there is OSPF videos in the master playlist. So please take advantage of that. That will help with leading up to this discussion. So I'm, I'm hoping that many of you who have been with me through these videos have gone through those with me previously, and now we're just enhancing or adding on top of the OSPF discussion as opposed to seeing it brand new. Now, if you are seeing it brand new, just go back through the playlist and go through the videos in order. I've put them in the right order in the master playlist. You can look at all the OSPF ones in order. There's also some on layer two in the correct order with trunking and VLANs and spanning tree and so forth that can be enjoyed and, and re-enjoyed over and over again just by going through those playlists. Okay, let me take a look at any other questions here. Uh, Matt, or Matthew rather, Matthew is saying, you just cleared so much from what I've been studying from the book. Thank you, I love it. I love sharing and talking and, and discussing. I'm a super average learner, not super fast learner. And so when I, I just try to not try, my focus is to create content that I wish somebody had created for me and shown it to me and walked me through it. And again, if you're catching this video midstream, take a few, Set aside some time on a, a few hours a week and just go through the playlist step by step, and that way you can backfill all that great information. But Matthew, thank you for that. Okay, Dan is asking, at what time do you have to implement? At what time do you? If Dan, if you could restate that question regarding, um, at what time do you have to implement OSPF? Just phrase it a little bit differently, and I'll, that way I can make sure I'm answering the right question. I'd be happy to. I air, you're welcome, and. Oh, what kind of layer three switches am I using for the lab? Mm, just gen general Cisco flavored multi-layer switches that support routing. That's that's really the only special thing I have going here is that there's some 
uh, switches that don't support routing. They, they're not really a multi-layer switch. And then like in the older 3550s, there's two images. You can have like SMI and EMI images. But as long as it supports routing, you're good to go. And that's I'm not doing anything too fancy with these multi-layer switches. So I think you buy like 3550 switches with the EMI or maybe even 3560s on eBay for like 50, 60 bucks. I'm not a huge fan these days of buying hardware. I have a stack of hardware on the other side of this wall that I use occasionally if I have to break it out for something specific. But if you're new to CCNA and you haven't heard me say this yet, please, please, please join Net Academy for free, netacad.com, free. And then you can download Packet Tracer for free. And then it does virtually everything you'll need to do for CCNA right there. So dragging switches out to the topology, dragging routers out, connecting them together, configuring seconds, moments, as opposed to powering on a switch, waiting for it to power on, having the fan noise, having electricity burn uh, burn up because you're using the electricity. When I got my first CCI, I had to do that. I had a stack of equipment. I live here in Vegas and all my gear was here in Vegas. I, I had to buy a separate enclosed rack and then vent it out the top just for the heat. So I had the air conditioning high. I had two vents coming into my office from the central air in the house and it still wasn't enough. So I vented out the rack, just take the heat and pump it out. Very expensive, very expensive. So if you can use... If you want the fastest, least friction path, pack a tracer. <laughs> and then if you go on to CCNP, there's other options as well that are quite good, including uh, for your own use, you can use license Viral, V-I-R-L from Cisco. It's a couple hundred bucks a year, but it's a year and it does everything. And version 2.0 is either out or it's coming out, which is even better. So great virtualization options that don't require buying hardware. There's also Genus 3, which is an option which people use from time to time. And uh, David Bumbel, Bumbel, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, has a great set of labs. If you search his name, you'll find it. There's also uh, Jeremy's IT Lab, which has a ton of training and for free on YouTube, including labs that you can do in Packet Tracer. And almost everything you've seen me, most of what you've seen me do in these live streams are also capable in the world of Packet Tracer. There are a few corner cases. I'm not going to point them out because you'll look for them. <laughs> but there, there's a few corner cases where it doesn't support the exact feature. I'll tell you, like BPDU filter, which isn't too important at the CCNA level, so not a big worry. But most everything is just so quick and easy that um, I strongly recommend Packet Tracer for starting out. And uh, great. So it looks like Ayer is answering questions. Fantastic. Okay, how do you change the font on real appliance? I can do it on Packet Tracer. So, on a, <laughs> great. So in Packet Tracer, there's options to change the font, make it bigger, smaller, change it. On a on a device, a real network device, if you're connecting to it, we're going to connect to it with some kind of a terminal emulator. So like 30 years ago, when we had mainframes, we'd have these big terminals that were connected, and that's how you interface with the system, the mainframe. And then the concept of a terminal or a terminal emulator we still use today from our PC. So if we're launching a terminal emulator like Putty, that's a fantastic free terminal emulator, or uh, who would I used to use all the time? There's also some commercial ones you can use that support SSH and serial connections and Telnet. Friends don't let friends use Telnet in production environments though, because it's not secure. So in that terminal emulator, secure CRT was the one I was thinking of, uh, that the production one. Anyway, in those applications, those terminal emulators that you run on your PC or your Mac or your, your device, they have custom options to change the font. And that's how you change your font to make it bigger or smaller as you interface with those devices. It's in the terminal emulator software where it's going to make it appear a certain way in colors or no colors in the background, foreground, so forth. Great question. Thanks for that question. All right, Risky if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Ruski is asking, I see videos and labs explaining multiple routers on the same broadcast domain, but how common is this in the real network? Uh, great, great question. Um, most companies are gonna have some fault tolerance for their routing. And so as a result, if they're running OSPF, they're probably gonna have at least two, which represents DR and BDR, and they'll have a full adjacency with each other, and very much likely not a third unless there's a need for it. So a common network segment, how many routers do you really need for a common network segment? Maybe one, and then a backup would be your other one, your DR, your BDR. So 
in this scenario, I put four routers on the same network segment because I wanted to demonstrate D DR, BDR, DR others, and then two-way adjacencies, which is really a, really isn't an adjacency. It's really a, I know you're there. I'm in the two-way state, and a druther, um, my and my role is druther, DR other. So I would say that in a production environment, probably not too common to have like five or six routers on the same segment. It's a little bit of overkill, but two, certainly. Great question. And uh, Ruski, basically uh, that same question. Uh, in my experience, if routers are on the same segment, they don't tend to share routes. Routers are usually connected together on different subnets. And if you had two on the same segment, it would primarily be for fault tolerance for that network. I totally agree. Um, <laughs> I wonder if ums count in the post show in the Q and A. Maybe I'm going to still work on that. David's asking. Oh, this is for everyone. So fantastic. And uh, Vladdy is asking, I would like to thank you for all the interesting content you have on your channel. Help me on my journey to become a CCNA. I was able to pass the ICD. I was able to pass the ICD two exam last week. Yes, yes. Congratulations, beating Cert Apocalypse by uh, a, a week or so. Congratulations. That is so so awesome. I encourage you to keep on studying and keeping on learning. And also, I'm going to set up a Discord channel. I got that recommendation uh, last week. And so I'm going to do that as a place where people can get together and chat and communicate more openly and, and anytime they want to. So that's in process. I appreciate those recommendations. So if you have your CCNA currently and you want to give back or help, please join these streams and Discord or whatever other media is out there that you can join and help others learn. It's so fa fantastic. The benefit too is if you teach it or reinforce it for somebody else, you're really reinforcing it for yourself as well, which is a win, win, win. And Brian's stating, is it me? Or maybe this isn't a question for me, but is it me or is it? do the books look smaller compared to the previous test? The blueprint for CCNA 200-301 is smaller, smaller. There's not as much stuff as was covered previously. So they have one, and it's, it's not like they tried to cram CCNA security and CCNA wireless and CCNA route switch and CCNA, et cetera, all into one new CCNA. It is a thinned out streamlined CCNA so that people can get it and move forward to their specializations and CCNPs with core exams and concentration exams beyond that. Although they're not required, you can just go straight for a CCNP if you want. Okay. And trust the process, I appreciate you. Thank you for jumping in there and helping other people with questions and so forth. That, I think, wraps it up for this session on OSPF neighbor states. I've had a great time in this live stream with you. I will be keeping this Q&A. Uh, I won't be clipping it off so that you can go back to this video as part of the playlist for the CCNA Master Playlist anytime you want to and enjoy the content and also enjoy the Q&A if you want to do that. If you are studying with somebody else, that's a great idea. Having a study buddy is something that's very, very useful. Getting people behind you and support you or who are like-minded is critical as well. You may find people along the way who say you can't do it. They want you to give up. They want you to do less. And all I can say to them is nothing's going to stop you if you want it bad enough. And, you know, and I'm encouraging you to keep on going in spite of it, uh, in spite of any adversity. I've got a couple playlists as well. I'd like to point out if you go to my page and you go to playlists, there's some playlists on uh, how I got to become a CCI, double CCIE, there's, uh, which was a very normal process, nothing magical. There's videos on steps that I use to succeed, and I succeed very slowly. I'm just a persistent succeeder. That's the secret. <laughs> it's like every step, okay, that wasn't a great step. Take another step and another step and another step and another step. And if you have those goals, there's no magic. If you have the goals and just keep on going slowly. I've been on YouTube for 10 years. I think my first YouTube video is 2009. You want to hoot? Go check out those 2009 videos of me. Not good. I mean, not. they're fun, entertaining, but... Like, oh my gosh, who is that? Is that like Keith's evil twin? Uh, no, that's just a different version of me. I've been improving myself and trying to improve myself for the last uh, decade. And it's been working. A little more sleep, a little more exercise, a little better food, and a slightly different lifestyle. And it's been great. So uh, I think I've got all the questions. Oh, I have a few more questions. I'm going to keep this going then, if you have a few more. This is from uh, Rusky. My colleague set up an HSRP 
uh, that's a hot standby router protocol for fault tolerant default gateways. In a strange way, primary secondary routers, if the primary ISP goes down, the default gateway is still the primary as both routers use OSPF to exchange routes. As long as it works, that's awesome. So in, in case of uh, scenarios where you're implementing fault tolerance, the, the key ingredient is to test it. Like we're, this is set up so if this service provider goes down, we're gonna go ahead and still have connectivity. And the way to test that is yank the cable, turn it off, or set up an IP SLA. It's a, a, service, it's a way to verify a connection path through one side. And then you can also link or trigger HSRP based on that ping, or that SLA failing through one path to go ahead and decrement priority. And then you can use preempt to bring the other one up. So as long as it works, that's great. In the world of CCNA, the requirement for HSRP is to understand why it's important and how it works at a high, fairly high level. It doesn't say configure it, so they're not gonna ask you too many gnarly details about HSRP other than the fact, what is a, hot, what is a fault tolerant uh, layer protocol for a default gateway? So there's hot standby router protocol, uh, virtual router redundancy protocol, VRP, and there's a gateway load balancing protocol, all three. But they basically have two routers that are putting up an IP address that default that can be used as a default gateway. So if one of them goes down, the other one can take over and the intent is to not lose functionality for the client. All right, Shezzy 97 if that's your real name, is asking. Let me bring this mic over just a little bit. I'm really struggling to understand the difference between dynamic ARP inspection and IP source guard. Fantastic. Both reference the DHCP binding database and check for IP dynamic binding. So why do we need to both? That's great. So the question is dynamic ARP inspection versus source guard. Dynamic ARP inspection is only looking for lies regarding uh, ARP messages. That's it, dynamic ARP inspection. So if there's responses or feedback or anything that are dealing with ARP, address resolution protocol, that's what it's looking for. If somebody's lying about their IP address, like sending packets with a spoofed IP address, that's not being checked by default, by dynamic ARP inspection. It's just looking at ARP messages and making sure that we have a correct mapping at layer two for those based on ARP. So outside of ARP, source guard with the, is it called source guard still? Yeah. So source guard is making sure that that client who's sending packets isn't lying about their source IP address. So it's just one additional layer. Think about dynamic ARP inspection verifying ARP protocol and source guard verifying layer three spoofing of IP addresses. Good question. And that's, that's how it works. Yeah. Oh, trust the process. Right on. Awesome. So great feedback from the group. This is a, uh, we have another stream coming up on Saturday. It's going to be subnet Saturday. So if you are joining me for these streams, that's another one that's really fun. Last time we talked about the finger game, which was great. And this time we're going to go ahead and start carving out custom subnets and applying them. And we're going to leverage everything we've used up to this point in our subnet Saturdays. So if you need to catch up on that, you can look at the playlist, the master playlist on YouTube. And in that master playlist, there's details about the subnet Saturdays. I put them all together in the playlist. So they're just like one after the other. All right. Thanks, everybody. I've had a great time. I appreciate you making my afternoon a good one. And we'll see you in the very, very next stream. Thanks, everybody.
what you're putting in. All your hopes are never.